Hello everyone, this is Michael Michaelidis and today I want to talk about Martin Heidegger, a philosopher that has influenced me and has influenced this show a lot, and a philosopher who is mainly misunderstood, if ever understood. Now, to be clear, I don't claim to understand Heidegger fully, and the parts that I do understand, I was helped by a tutor uh, by the name of Michael Millerman, who runs an online school, not affiliated in any way, but uh, I know the man himself is a philosopher, a great teacher, and is a scholar on Heidegger, amongst others. Heidegger reminds me why philosophy is so great, because the sea is so deep. In other words, I imagine people like bathers on a beach. Most will never go in and swim. Most will never actually read a book from Plato or Aristotle, or even ponder the questions that are asked there. Some will, and will kind of test the waters reading a book or two, and some others, like yours truly, will go out and learn how to swim, learn how to think in these terms, learn the history, learn a bit of the spectrum, the different schools, perhaps, of philosophy. What is it all about? What can we draw from it? And start enjoying themselves swimming. Uh, as you're swimming, you may look down, dive your head a little bit and see the beautiful depths. Fish swimming, corals, things shining, coming in and out of existence. That is when you get really interested in philosophy. Now, that's when you not only read Plato, but you stop on one thing that Plato said and just ponder, like understanding that it's not just a word on the surface, that you can swim. It has depth, this single word, this single sentence of Plato. You can think about it the whole day, the whole month. It has depth. There's more happening below. That's when I believe you start becoming a philosopher yourself. And then you start diving and diving and diving and taking more and more and more and more. And then maybe you develop a capacity and you're very proud. You've read all of Plato. You've read enough and you, you, you're the type of diver that goes in 30 meters with a single breath. And then as you're diving, you notice a shade moving at the bottom. Very deep. That's Heidegger. That is 130 meters. So he is like, well done, actually. Well done on these 30 meters. But I'm diving 130 meters with a single breath. And guess what? I've touched the bottom. And here's the proof. There's a bit of sand there. I recently read one of Heidegger's lectures on the philosopher Heraclitus. Heraclitus himself was called the Obscure or Scotinos because even back in his days, people did not understand him. Or perhaps, as Heidegger reminds us, he was the philosopher of the Obscure. He dealt with what is hidden. He dealt with the deep. Heraclitus wrote in short sentences, apothegmata, uh, which are now numbered and we have a small catalog. Uh, one of the most famous is, you know, uh, no man can walk this across the same river twice, because it's not the same river and he's not the same man. It reminds us of the eternal flow of energy. A river is just water coming in. It's not a thing, right? It's a process. So when you cross it, that process is in one state. When you cross again, it's a different chunk of water. Therefore, it's a different river. And you, your body is like a river. It's like a river of energy, constantly moving, cells dying, being regenerated. That's one way of seeing it. But Heidegger reminds us there's more. The phrase, the apothegma, that um, caught my attention, and Heidegger pays a lot of attention, that right, is um, three words, physis, cryptes, the fili. Okay, physi, usually translated as nature, cryptes, to hide, Fili, philia. We had an episode on what that word meant for the ancient Greeks. It's translated as befriends. Nature befriends hiddenness, or nature likes to hide, is how it's translated in most modern translations, right? So Heidegger passes through various understandings, which reminded me this diving aspect, okay? On one level, perhaps the swimming level, you can say, okay, nature likes to hide. What can this mean? Okay, we have modern science, after all. Science investigates nature, and science discovers things that are indeed hidden, like gravity. Gravity is not evident. It's not obvious. 
which is why ancient people didn't really consider it, right? They saw things falling, but they didn't say, ah, there's a hidden force there pulling them down. Newton, other scientists said that. So you can translate this very simply that nature has obvious parts and it has hidden parts. And it's that hidden parts, once you understand them, that they are there, they exist, everything else makes sense, right? It's only when we understood that gravity exists, although invisible. You can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't hear it, but that is what organizes the motions of the stars, right? And ancient people had trouble fitting the motion of the stars in the model because they didn't understand, perhaps, that there's a central force pulling everything together. They're spinning around, they're moving in circles. Everything makes sense, right? That's one way of seeing it. That's one way of interpreting it. But Heidegger wants us to dive a little bit more, okay? After all, Heraclitus was not a physicist. After all, Heraclitus never mentioned gravity. There's nothing in Heraclitus implying that that is what Heraclitus meant. That is our modern projection back to it thousands of years later, right? Thesis in ancient Greek and to some degree modern can mean what do we say the nature of something, not the nature as in the trees and the stars above us, the nature of something. Okay, we can say it's not in his nature to become a painter. You know, it's in his nature to become a trader. Okay, so we understand there's something essential within someone that defines them. Also, we can say that about a species, you know, the nature of horses, the nature of dogs, the nature of cats. Now, nature is very tricky because it's something that all these uh, examples of a species have in common. All horses have something we can call horseness if you will, the nature of being a horse. But if we are asked to say exactly what that nature is, it's almost impossible to articulate, right? Plato almost made a career out of noticing that, you know? Um, and he began with something much simpler than horses. He began with geometrical patterns like circles. We recognize a circle when we see it, yet we have never seen a perfect circle. You know, we say this shape reminds me of a circle. I mean, I know there's even a competition of people who draw circles with their hands and they win awards according to how accurate these circles are, right? Like accurate according to what? Well, according to an imaginary perfect circle that we have never seen, right? It doesn't exist in nature. And you can imagine back in ancient Greece where industrial production was not existed, like the circles that people could make were even poorer, okay? And so with circles, so with horses, so with dogs. What is it essential about a dog that is common in the poodle or in the German shepherd, making them both dogs, but uncommon to the cat? How can we define it? It's almost impossible, yet we recognize it when we see it. Nature, the nature of a dog is obvious when we see it, but it's hidden. It's somewhere in the dogs, all the dogs that exist. The nature of something is hidden. Now, that, it, just a small, because some of you might be saying, oh, now we have modern science. We can take the DNA and analyze it and say this specific sequence, that is a dog. Well, here's the trick to that. How would a scientist proceed to do that? Well, he would probably take a population of dogs, analyze their DNA, and take a population of other animals that are not dogs, because you need a double bind experiment, and analyze that and say the difference between this set of animals and that set of animals, whatever difference, that is the dog. That is dogness right there. But there's a trick, because for the scientist to select the dogs and take their DNA, he must have pre-decided which animals are dogs and which are not. He already knows which animals to choose as dogs, which means that his experiment is not used to define who is a dog. His experiment starts with already having this knowledge of what is a dog and what is not. So that knowledge pre-exists whatever experiment must. Otherwise, the scientist wouldn't even know which animals to test for and test against, right? That is the question that Plato so accurately portrays, as with dogs, so with bravery, with love, with friendship, with all these things that Plato discusses in his dialogues. We recognize them immediately when we see them. We fall in love, 
we recognize a brave act, a just act, an unjust act quite easily. But what is justice? I cannot tell, at least not exactly. That is the mystery. That is diving at 30 meters with a single breath. That's enough. Pondering these things. Plato, like I said, made a career. And Heidegger says, well, there is more. <laughs> How can there be more in this sentence? Well, Heidegger observes that in all my efforts to explain and to understand what it means, what Heraclitus meant by nature loves to hide, I'm trying to resolve a tension. I'm obviously understanding that there's a contradiction here. Nature is the most conspicuous thing, which means the most obvious thing is that which we see. Hiddenness is what's not seen. So nature, the most obvious, is the hidden. There's a contradiction, and Heidegger says, you have to stay in that contradiction, like you do with everything in life. We try to resolve things, a breakup, a failed business, a broken friendship. We try to go back and say, it was okay, or I learned, or whatever. We see the badness, and we try to juxtapose some goodness, and to contrast it, but we have to stay in this contradiction. It is a contradictory statement. And like all contradictory statements uttered by mystics, they're trying to push you away from logic, be behind logic, before logic, more than logic. Heraclitus' statement is not correct, Heidegger re reminds us. It's just true, the two being different. Logic just corresponds word with fact. Truth reveals being and the facts. Okay, and the way to intuit towards it is actually with what you see around you, light. And light is the key word to understand ancient Greek civilization as a whole. Because light has a secret, which is that light reveals everything apart from its own self. You never see light, you see all the objects illuminated by light. Or in another sense, you only see light, you don't see objects. In fact, what I'm seeing is light reflected on this object, but it's light that I'm seeing. But if you see the light, if you focus on the light, on the energy, there is the object disappear, they become one, they become just different ways that this energy reveals itself. If you focus on the objects and actually try to navigate yourself in this life, you forget the light, you don't see the light, the light becomes invisible. So it's, it's not that nature has two parts, it's not that I have two parts, one visible, one invisible, um, trying to resolve this contradiction, is that being itself is visible and invisible. Beings, plural, are visible when being, what animates them, is invisible. Being, God, as you will, light is asleep is invisible when it's animating things. We are all navigating this world of beings, of things that exist, but we are in the dark because we never experience the force that animates it, the force that is behind our own existence. When I am here, God is not here. Uh, when God will be here, I'll be gone. So perhaps Khalil Gibral had it right all along. Every man is two men. One is awake in the darkness, the other asleep in the light.